Here's the question then. Is it worth being a Christian? Now, the good answer would be yes. I'm saying yes because it's living with hope. I think we've probably got five things. We'll see how we go. Five reasons why in 1 Peter chapter 1, he wants us to walk out of here tonight going, yes, if flipping is worth it, really worth it. But before we dive into those five reasons, just look with me at the introduction. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. People have done PhDs on this letter and who wrote it and when and where and stuff. I've got 28 minutes to play with. Let me just say to you that the consensus is that it's written by Peter from Rome to Christians in what we'd now call Turkey. The odds are it happens when the Emperor Nero is killing Christians in Rome where Peter lives. What we do know for certain, because the letter shouts it out to us as we read it, is that there are persecuted Christians who really need help. And they really need support. And this letter is a letter of support to those really under the cosh seriously under pressure. Look at the words in verses one to two. Elect exiles, verse one. Look, he starts straight away. He says, I've got you, I've got you. God's got you. You may be exiles, but my friend, he's got you. Safe from the beginning of time. There's a foreknowledge, verse two. There she is. Elect foreknowledge. Whatever comes your way, whatever's gonna happen to you, I've got you. I've got you back all the time. And it runs through the letter. I've got you, I've got you, you're safe with me. Even the Trinity's invoked. The foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. The whole Trinity pulls together for these churches. Why? So that grace and peace may be multiplied to them. Now I don't know what's going on in your life as you don't in mine, but here's the thing. Whatever the world throws at us tonight, the whole trinity of the universe has got the Christian. God has got the Christian in his hand, and there's no chance, there's no chance that we're not going to come out on top of this. Not a single chance. As it was then, so it is now. But to really dig on this, imagine, imagine if today, as a Christian, where you live, and there may be many in this room who know this, You wouldn't just lose your student loan, or maybe your place at university, or maybe your job, or maybe your neighborhood policeman knocks on the door and says, hello, would you like to come down the police station, please? You're a Christian, aren't you? Or maybe your life, and we'll hear this week of people who lose their life in the name of Christ. These people did, people do today. Would I opt for Christ under that kind of pressure? Is the suffering worth it? Our theme tonight in chapter one is, oh, it's worth it. And Peter's going to unpack to these churches, as the scriptures will to us tonight, five reasons why it's worth it. And I'll just flash them up and go at them. Here's reason number one. They're all looks. Look forward to eternal life. Come with me on three to five. But all the time as we read this now, Get your eyes on this, and of course it's for them and it's for you and me. Look forwards now, my friend. Look forwards to what's coming. Blessed be the God and Father, verse three, of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. Christianity unapologetically deals with death. The date in your diary you probably won't put in, but you won't miss it. The sell-by date that's coming that you will hit. The day you'll meet the famous Welsh undertaker who signed his letters, yours eventually, Evans above. (laughs) The day will come when it's done. So what's it all for? Peter says here in verse three, I'll tell you what it's for. 
Your life is to be born again. It's an ashamedly dealing with death. Be born again for a living hope. That's why verse one, we're exiles. Because we're not born for this world. None of us are. Whether you'd say I'm not a Christian tonight or you say I'm keen as anything. Here's what the Bible says to all. We weren't born for this. We were born for something greater. Verse four, an inheritance, an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance kept in heaven for you. For many of you in the room tonight, imagine if you got a call tomorrow saying, when you're 30, you get a, a million quid inheritance waiting for you. You're like, yes, thank you very much. I love it. Now, for many of us, we're way past it and it's too late. 30 was a long time ago. But you know what? I know somebody who's due a million pounds when they're 30. I've become good pals with them recently. And, uh, <laughs> and here's the thing, right? Right? Whoa, that's something to grab hold of. Now, I'm scooting over this, but look, most philosophies in the world don't deal with the inheritance of eternal life. Whatever's in your face tonight, whatever's wrong, whatever's tough, there is an inheritance for those who trust in Christ that lasts forever, and it is unstoppable. Look, unstoppable, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. The Christian doesn't outlive only amongst their contemporaries. The Christian outdies contemporaries because they've got their picture ahead. Keep your eyes there on what's coming ahead of you. Look forward to eternal life. And verse five, here's the same thing again. However rough it gets, however poxy it feels sometimes, here's the bottom line. Verse five, if we're in Christ, we're being guarded. He will not let me go. No chance. I don't know what's going on tonight for you, but he won't let you go. Not a chance if you've trusted in him. Look forward to that. And you know this matters because the second look digs in for these people to the pressure they were under. Look forwards, because when you look in to your current experience, whew, what will you find? Look up there, because when you look in, six to nine, in this you rejoice. In what? In looking forward. Why? Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The Christian has no exception to grief in this world. In fact, verse six, grieved by various trials means that for many of us, at some point, all of us, I guess, will say, is he there? Why has he done it? Do I believe it anymore? Can I keep going with this? What's going on here? If he's really there, if there's something to look forward to, why this? Verse seven gives the answer. We're not immune to it, but he is utterly committed to the day when a milligram of faith in him will be worth a million tons of gold, gold, imperishable gold. A day will come when what the Lord does in our lives because of this broken world and his hand is on that thermostat, he won't let you go further. He will not let the pain be more than is endurable. He is right there and he is going to change and purify in the brokenness of this world and prepare you for that day. When you cross that finishing line and that milligram of faith in Christ will be worth a universe of gold because he was there all along preparing you for that day. Look into that current experience. And eight to nine are remarkable, aren't they? Though you haven't seen him, you love him. <laughs> How mad is that, by the way? How mad is that? You haven't seen him. Something in your heart goes, but I love him. Sometimes you're clinging on to it, aren't you? I love him. Oh, it's a remarkable thing to have. Oh my goodness, you get used to it. There's no awe in it for me often. It is remarkable. Christ does this in us. Outrageously magnificent. You don't see him, you love him. You don't 
No, no, you don't see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy inexpressible, filled with glory, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How many times has anyone said in this room, God, I would change what happened, but I would never change what it did to me. Do you know that feeling? Oh God, I wish that thing had never happened. It was grim in my life. But what it's done to me has made me so much more grateful for Christ. This happens to the Christian. Somehow, we work out that I'm not what I was born genetically. I'm not only what I was because of behaviorism. I am defined by my future and I have a loving God who has his hand on that thermostat, who has his hand on my soul and says, my friend, I love you in this pain. And something in us says, I love you too. Sometimes when we're on top, we think that God needs us and he had no chance without us. Ever been like that sometimes? Cool, he's lucky he's got me. My word, if he didn't have me, he might struggle in this city. And then sometimes your life, you go, hard, oh, you know, at the moment, I'm just clinging on to him by my fingertips, but I'm just, I'm just got him. There he is. Thank you, Jesus. And then when you get a bit older, some, uh, many will recognize this. You used to think that you were holding on to him by your fingertips, and you're just feeling his joy by holding on. And then it dawns on you one fine day that actually he's been holding on to you all along from the very beginning, and your fingertips are rubbish, but he's not going anywhere because he's got you. And at that moment, isn't it joy inexpressible and full of glory? Because you go, yes, why me? What a hope. What a hope to know Christ. That's why we come here, to remind ourselves together that we have the greatest message in the world that makes sense to the heart and the mind of a human being. Christ is all this joy inexpressible in the human heart that is grace. And come with me to the third look. As we look in to the existential, the personal, the inside subjective experience of Christ, isn't the Bible marvelous? Peter now takes those Christians as he takes us and says, all right, enough looking in, because if you look in for a bit, you can see the work I do. Look in too long and you'll be introspective. So look up for a minute now. Look out, he says, to current truth. Read with me, 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation that will give you joy inexpressible and full of glory, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully and inquired what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. The message of salvation was foretold in the Old Testament. The biography was read before the person had lived. That's a unique biography. All the foretelling of what, verse 11, the sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glories. The whole story was foretold. And in verse 12, the apostles themselves with the message of the New Testament were given the final explanation of the whole picture. That's why the Christian needs the scriptures. That's why the Bible constantly balances. Look in to see what Christ is doing, but never to the exclusion of his objective word of truth. Get into a church where the Bible is taught systematically week after week after week after week. Read the Bible for yourself. Get into the scriptures. That's why at Word Alive, the word of God is the heart of the very thing we do here in song, in prayer, in reading, in preaching. That's why the whole program is built around God's objective truth. Christ foretold, Christ fulfilled, Christ to come. And it's because of that that we have this marvelous capacity to look out as well as inside. 
The Bible foretells our suffering. It foretells the problems. It foretells the glory yet to come. It's all predicted. It's all there. Nothing need take us by surprise. I urge myself more than I urge you to trust this word of God and to judge myself against it, not solely against how I feel. For it will explain the sufferings and the glory of the Christian life. For no disciple is greater than his master. Well, we'll take two more, two more of the looks. But come with me to verse 13 first. Peter is now expecting us to think, all right then, okay, I've got you so far, they might have said. We're looking forward to a day which will be a glorious inheritance, make sense of death through new birth. I can see the moments in my life when at my lowest ebb I've reached for the Lord Jesus and he's grabbed me and said, come here, love. I'm with you. I'm no great Bible scholar, but you know what? I love hearing the word taught. I try and read. I try and think. I sing praises for the word of God. I look out. And now Peter says to this church, as he says to us, these churches, as he says to us, verse 13, so prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, look up to holiness. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Verse 1. Holiness is that quality of God which makes him who he is. And he's our father and we're his kids. My reference point should not be what anyone else thinks of me. Too rarely I say, what does God think about this? My eyes are on you. What do you think? Holiness isn't wet, wimpish, or cocky. It's deciding who's right, who runs the world, who made it all. Look up who's in charge of the whole picture, who's in charge of the show. Go God's way. You'll be the odd one out so often, the misfit. You just will. But where are my eyes? Are my eyes on him or on you? And we are to think about this, verse 13. Prepare your minds for action. Think now tonight. Come away to Word Alive. Sit here and say, right, when I'm back at work, when I'm back with the kids, when I'm at school, when I'm back at my uni, Lord Jesus, I am going to look up to your great holiness. And my eyes are going to be on you. Right now the Lord will be saying to you, where aren't you like that? Can I help you with this? Let me at it with you. Keep your eyes on God's holiness and you will trade the reality for the unreality. The reality is God's holiness. And look, his judgment, verse 17. There is a judgment to come. And all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all, to account for the things that they have done. Look at him. Look up to him now. Your dad. Isn't it great when he changes you a bit? What about that moment, right? Right? You know you've blown this particular one, whatever this particular one is, a few times. You've blown it, you're struggling to get past it, and then one day, you say, Lord, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And what about that moment when you don't? How high is the buzz? You know, when it's too late to go back, you haven't done it, whatever it may be. You've all got your own it's now, right? You're wondering what mine is. Ha-ha. <laughs> past it, past it, can't go back. Yes! <laughs> It's so good, isn't it? It's your father's desire. It's your father's hope for you. And you're going, bye. 
Oh, you may fall back two or three more times and then you're bang on again. But you know, your life coach, your savior of the universe, your holy God, his spirit who lives within you is never going away and he's holding on to you and he's saying, look at me, look at me, come on my friend, don't go, come this way. And he loves you. And he's not there going, waster, loser. He's going to be holy as I'm holy. But it's not to slaughter you. It's to say, come on, kid. I'll take you with me. Look at me now. Come on, look at me, look at me. Look at me when it matters. Oh, those victories are grand, aren't they? Infrequent, but grand. Joy of following our great holy God. This is a living hope if ever there was one. And where else would you find it in any philosophy in the whole world? Nowhere. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the radicals of the universe. Because we know who's right. And we see who's right. And we know he loves us despite our rubbish failings. And he will never leave us. What a place to find yourself this evening. And finally, look back to the cross because all this is possible because of the cross of Christ. Oh, the cross of Christ. I preach nothing but Christ crucified. Verse 18, look back to the cross knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Here we go again, look, he was foreknown. The Lord knows it all. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Look at 18, he doesn't pull his punches, does he? The way of life handed down was futile, rubbish, waste of space. Would you dare say that? What we've inherited in this world without Christ is rubbish, futile, wasted. That's what he says. Because verse 17 is heading for judgment. Hey, silver or gold, irrelevant. Wedge in your wallet, money, irrelevant. Status, irrelevant. Christ, total relevance to the meaning of the universe. It was foreknown from the beginning, verse 20, that this would be the key. It's been the key to the universe from the beginning of it all. The Lord knew it. And in 21, who through him are believers in God. You know, if somebody says, I know I'm a Christian, if somebody says then, you arrogant so-and-so, who do you think you are? If you know Christ is your only hope and your great savior and without him you have nothing, the believer can turn around and say, no, no, you don't understand. It's not what I've done. I know I'm a Christian because Christ died on a cross. 3.18 will tell us Christ died for sin once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. No, no, I'm not a Christian because I'm a big time Charlie and I think I'm better than you. I'm a Christian because Christ did it for me. And if a person turns and says, I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm really doing my best to be a Christian. Maybe you say that. I, I, I'm trying. My dearest friend, I have to say to you, you don't understand that it's all of Christ and you don't try to be a Christian. It's a gift. And so either a person tonight in this room can say yes because of the blood of Christ. I am a Christian. It's been done for me. I look back to the cross. It's been done for me. It's my gift from my dying and risen savior. Then however rubbish a year you've had, Christ is yours and you are his because it don't depend on you whatsoever. Is that a relief? It doesn't depend on you at all. 
It was foreknown from the beginning that he would have you. Oh, God, what a relief. And if tonight you're saying, I'd like to be, I wish I was, I think I am, I'm trying to be, you throw your weight on Christ. Throw it all on Christ who's done it all that you can do nothing to achieve. That is the work of the cross that ransomed us, verse 18, that liberated us, that set us free from the punishment for sin that we so deserve. It was through him, verse 21, that we can look back to the cross. It's because of Christ. So, is it worth being a Christian? <laughs> I love it. Yes. Because it's living with hope. And look, you don't have to live long to realize it's so easy to live without hope. Look forward to a day when you cross that finishing line. And he says, Hiya, come in. I've got it all waiting for you, my friend. Get yourself in here. Because it will surely come when you die, if you know him. Look into those times when you've left here maybe and your guts are wrenched with pain and agony at the world and the way you're being treated within it. And you turn to Christ and you say, you haven't gone anywhere, stick with me in this, please. And somehow deep down inside, the day comes when you say, he is with me, I'm in crying and I have joy in Christ all at the same time. What a savior, what a weak person I am, what a hope he gives me. And even then you will look out to the word of God and see that it was all predicted, the suffering of these Christians of the dispersion, as it is for his people always. It will never be easy. The scriptures have warned us, we get into the scriptures, we listen, we read them, and we see that it's all promised, but he will never, ever, ever let his foreknown people go. As a result, will you look up to the great God of holiness and say, oh, come on, Lord, I want to win a few more battles. Come on, be with me in it, eh? I want to fight that thing that I know kills my soul. Hey, I'm too weak to do it on my own, but it will, if I align with you and ask for your strength and your help, I want to take it on because I want you to be the master of right and wrong, not what the world says and not what my instinct says. Come on, Lord, you love me. Be with me in it. And he yearns to be with me in it. That's why you're special if you know Christ. He's in it with you. And as we look back to the cross tonight, Say back there, that shadow casts itself right over us tonight. No merit of our own, total merit of Christ as he substitutes himself to take the wrath that I deserve of a holy God that I may be liberated and set free to really live now and forever. May word alive this week in all its shapes and forms of community and teaching and thinking and prepping and praying and singing and eating and chatting and playing. May it all lend itself to you to say, I can live with hope because my God is a great saving God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord for your great scriptures. We thank you for Peter and his courage. We thank you for these believers spread around in Turkey and their willingness to stand for Christ. We ask for ourselves that we may know more and more and more of your grace as we look for that living hope in you. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.